Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on The Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. One of the most daunting challenges India faces is to ensure that tens, maybe hundreds of millions of children who lost two years of school because of COVID recover their lost learning. This is not just critical for the children themselves, it's fundamentally important to the future of our country. So today we ask, how is India faring? Joining me to answer that question is the CEO of the Azim Premji Foundation and the Vice Chancellor of the Azim Premji University, Anurag Beher. Dr. Beher, in a recent article for Mint, you wrote about your observations of how schools are progressing in terms of helping children recover the learning they've lost because for two years during COVID, schools were virtually shut down. You say, and I'm quoting you, the All India Report Card seems mixed. And it turns out that it varies class to class, school to school, state to state. So could you start by expanding on this? So Karan, like you said, uh, I mean, this is a once in a century sort of a crisis, you know, where children didn't go to school for two years and they didn't learn what they should have learned in those two years. But not just that, you know, as we've discussed before in this very show, uh, they, if children don't go to school, they forget a lot of what they had learned earlier. So this has been a massive loss of learning. Uh, over the past year or so, uh, I think all state governments have uh, launched programs to recover this lost learning. Uh, but as we stand here today, uh, and as I have observed uh, on the ground, the report card is mixed. And that's only to be expected, really, you know, in a country like ours. And it's mixed in, let's say, two ways. One is you will see uh, school-wide differences or teacher-wide differences. And that is only to be expected because there are teachers of varying capacities. There are teachers of varying commitment. Uh, there are schools where schools have been more systematic. And therefore, you'll have schools or teacher classes where the recovery is much better than other places. And I think that's, uh, that's just what one should expect. Uh, the other kind of uh, uh, variation and the other kind of that's a driver of that mixed report card, is that they're cross-state differences. And uh, those are systematic differences. So there's some states that are doing uh, uh, all right, some states that are doing much better, some states that are not doing so well, some states that are way behind. And therefore, that just points to the fact that uh, while there will be teacher-based differences across schools, but there are certain kind of uh, measures that at systemic level we are taking or not taking, which can enable or hinder this recovery of lost learning. Now, before I come to discuss the examples you provide in your Mint article about schools and how they're faring, because I think those examples are eye-opening and they illustrate the problem, let me, for the audience, actually state what lies at the heart of the problem. For example, and this is something you cite in your article, children who, are, who were in class three in March 2020, when schools shut down, are now after schools have reopened in class six, which means they've never been through classes four and five. That also means that three years of teaching has to be crammed into one. And as you pointed out, this problem can be made additionally difficult by the fact 
that many of the children have actually forgotten a lot of what they learned in class three. So there's a huge amount of lost learning that has to be made up in one year. And it has to be made up, for instance, in this example, by children who are in class six having to catch up for what they never taught in four and five. That is the heart of the problem, isn't it? Absolutely. That's the heart of the problem. And uh, just so that we are perhaps a bit more specific, uh, the schools were completely shut from that March uh, 2020 period to, let's say, the, for the next year. Subsequently, uh, while they were again shut for the second wave, they were sort of sporadically opened across the, the country, right? Uh, but, you know, education didn't really happen. So one can really say that uh, they were, I mean, education was disrupted for that entire two-year period. And uh, it led to exactly what you said, absolutely exactly what you said. And uh, it is indeed a staggering task. Uh, how does one recover three years of learning or two years of learning and this year's syllabus, so to say, in one year? And, uh, you know, as we have discussed before, uh, different states uh, launched programs for recovery of lost learning because uh, this is a crisis that everybody is fully aware of. And uh, I would say that most of the design of the programs was uh, very reasonable. But before we come to that, let's go to the illustrations you provide, because I think it's important for the audience to realize what this actually amounts to. Now, you cite the example of a class six that you visited with 16 children. You say, and I'm quoting you, only two of the children can add two digit numbers. Eight can write legibly, but only three of them can write a sentence with minimal cogency. Then you add, when asked to read what I write, five of them read haltingly, some of the rest simply recognized letters, but a few recognized nothing. Now, given that we're talking about class six, this is a very disturbing and worrying situation. Absolutely, Karan. And uh, in that same class, in that same class, before I started having that conversation, the students and every one of those students went onto the blackboard and performed a division for a four digit number. So how is it that they could perform a division of a four digit number and couldn't do mental addition or subtraction of two digit numbers? And the answer is very simple, because it's not as though they had learned anything. It is just that they have a by rote or they just memorize certain sums and they're just writing it on the blackboard. And the moment you take away from those sums and bring them back to the very basics, unfortunately, those kids have forgotten whatever they had learned perhaps in class three and uh, have not learned much. And that comes off, uh, uh, that comes off the fact that uh, at least in that class or in that school, there was very little attention to recovering lost learning. The entire focus was on what should have been the syllabus or what is the syllabus for the so-called current class. And that's meaningless, you know, because if the kids don't know the basics, they don't know what is to be known in class three, class four, class five, and you start teaching them the syllabus of class six, what's the point? Well, in fact, there you illustrated a critical problem that the teachers face. They are concentrating on the new syllabus of class six, but the children have never been taught class four and class five. Therefore, you can't expect them to understand class six. And many of these children may have forgotten what they learned in class three. So recovery has to be the priority. Teaching the current syllabus can only happen afterwards. It can't happen until recovery is complete. Isn't that correct? Yes. And, you know, uh, it is, it, you know, it would be, it would be, uh, shall I say, funny if it were not so tragic, you know, which is that why does it take us to discuss this at all? Isn't it just the most simple and basic thing that you can't teach children class six syllabus unless they've learned class three, four, five? It's truly remarkable that we are caught in a situation where in many schools or uh, you know regions, you have a situation where teachers are teaching class six or class seven syllabus when the kids don't know what they should have learned in class three, four, five. Why is this a question at all? It's remarkable. Absolutely. And again, that raises fundamental and disturbing questions about the school authorities and about the teachers, because as you say, this should be obvious to them. It's not something that they should even try and experiment around. But let's come to another example, again, from your Mint article. You visited a class four, this time in a different school and in a different state to the earlier class six. 
And here you found that none of the 13 children could either read or write. And again, it's only class four I accept. But if none of the 13 can read or write, this is once again deeply disturbing and worrying. Well, Karan, uh, that particular school, there's a an interesting layer to the story which I didn't write about, which is none of the 13 children could read or write in class four. But if you look at class five in the same school, all the children could read and write, all. And they were, let's say, roughly at what would you would expect of them in class five at that level. And why is that so? That is so because that particular teacher was very conscious that without recovering lost learning, you can't move ahead. However, in her estimate, and you know, one could argue with her, but she's been effective in her estimate, the kind of energy required to recover lost learning, she could only invest that kind of energy with class five. So she put everything that she had into class five, got them to recover the lost learning. That's why they are where they are. Class four, she didn't invest any energy. When I asked her, why did she do it like that? She said, look, and that's a wonderful answer, which is she said, look, these class five kids from March, April onwards, they will move out of my school. They go to a middle school. You know, that's where the schools are structured, class one to five and six to eight and onwards. So they will move out of my school. Once they move, move out of my school, I have not discharged my responsibility if I haven't got them back to the level that they should be. Therefore, I made sure that they are back to the learning level that they should be. With class four, I have another year. So I will make sure that they recover. So, you know, again, it's the teacher's clarity and the teacher's sense of responsibility that led to this peculiar situation where class five has recovered and class four is where it is. I, I'm glad you called it clarity and responsibility. It seems also to me it is the teacher's personal decision to concentrate on one class at the cost of another. There is a downside to this, that the children in class four who are not being assisted to make the recovery for the classes three and two that they missed are actually going to end up wasting a whole year in class four. So while she's helped class five, the children in class four are losing another year. And therefore, when they get to class five, it won't be just two years of recovery, it'll be three. So I understand the point you're making, that decisions made by teachers explain the difference, but those decisions can also add to the problem. And clearly in this instance, that is going to happen. Karan, I will disagree with you. In this particular instance, I think the teacher has made a, a, a reasonable choice. Okay. Because given, you know, given in this particular instance, which is that given that she's alone and she has to handle class four, class five, class one, class two, class three, she has just as much energy she can. You know? One can blame the system as to why are there not enough teachers. But as far as she's concerned, I think she's made a very smart choice. Okay. And she's, you know, shown an amazing sort of sense of responsibility saying, look, I am, I must make sure that when these kids go out of my school, they have recovered lost learning. And I have another year with the four class four kids. I'll make sure they also recover. Except so that when the class four come to class five, it'll be yet more difficult because she'll have three years of learning to catch up on, not just two. So it's an additional burden she's putting on her own shoulders as well. And the fact that class four children will miss a whole year effectively because they're not learning anything is also a cost for them. But there is an example you cite of a school where actually the problem had been fairly well sorted out. Now, this third example comes from yet another state. But here you found that the way the school is functioning demonstrates near complete recovery. And this is particularly interesting because this is clearly a school that's doing all the right things. So can I start by asking what led you to the conclusion that in this class, in this school, we have near complete recovery. What led you to that conclusion? So uh, it's not complicated. I mean, you sit down with the kids and you sort of, uh, you, have to, you have to know what is the level of literacy and numeracy one expects at that age, right? So what kind of uh, addition, subtraction can they perform? Can they write three paragraphs in their own words? And when you give them something else, can they understand it? So you have to have an understanding of what level of learning should they have on language and math at that age. So I sat down with them and I went through with this uh, whole thing and they were uh, very good. I mean, they were, uh, you know, not all of them were as good as the other, but they were their, their learning levels were 
let's say the same kind of distribution that you would find in a, a reasonable class pre-COVID. So which means that they had recovered pretty much everything that they had lost. So it, it was remarkable. And uh, I must point out... I, you know, can I ask really you that? Uh, how much of the yeah. credit for this near-complete recovery goes to the teacher? How much goes to the school authorities who perhaps have told the teacher recovery is the priority, teaching the current syllabus can only happen after recovery is completed? Who do you give the credit to, teacher or school authorities? Karan, I think uh, dividing credit in that manner is, uh, it won't explain much, you know. So uh, in this particular case, and that sort of leads back to where we had started, the three different state examples that you talked about, right? I mean, the first one where there's pretty much no recovery of lost learning. The second where you had this, I think, wonderful teacher who made a very smart choice. And the third case where there's complete uh, uh, recovery of uh, lost learning, right? Those three, they're three different states. And those three different states have made three different kinds of choices. Now, in any state, whatever may be the choice that the state has made from a policy or direction perspective, as I was mentioning earlier, and yourself, you said, there would be differences across schools based on teachers. But when there are systematic differences across states, then that has something to do with what the state is doing or not doing, as you're calling them state authorities, right? So, uh, let me take you through the three states. In the first state, where in the first state, I mean, you know, I haven't yet done, or we've not done some research study for which I can sort of thumb the table and say that's the way it is, but we have enough anecdotal evidence of this. So in the first state, uh, the state government sort of, you know, a few months ago said, well, we have recovered all lost learning. That's not the reality on the ground. They just said we have recovered lost all, uh, recovered all lost learning. And from here on, all teachers must must teach the current year syllabus. So what, what that means is that uh, maybe seven months ago, six months ago, the teachers got an instruction from the state, a direction from the state that, well, all lost learning has been recovered. Now stop your effort on recovering lost learning. Just start teaching the current year syllabus. Can I interrupt that? Clearly, this is a state which doesn't understand the nature and extent of the problem and has convinced itself that in a very brief period of a couple of weeks or months, lost learning of two years can be recovered. So here, clearly, the state is to blame. They don't understand the extent of the problem. They are not keen to invest time and effort in recovery. They're only keen to get on with teaching the syllabus without realizing you can't teach a new syllabus if the kids haven't been through the first two years prior to that. So clearly here, the state is to blame. Yeah, that's correct. Absolutely. I mean, you know, teachers are... Everywhere you're good teachers and you have ordinary teachers, but in this particular case or any other state where you have a direction which says, look, <laughs> all recover, all learning has been that was lost has been recovered, and the direction changes like this, you have a problem. Okay. Let me before you go on, before you no, come before you go on. Let me go to the third state, you know, where there was near complete recovery of lost learning. That's a terrific state, a terrific direction. In that state, there is absolute clarity to everybody in the education system, all the teachers, all principals, that focus on recovering lost learning, get the kids back to a level where you can start teaching them the current year syllabus, which is just the obvious thing, as you called it, right? There is directional clarity, and that directional clarity is helping the teachers in the schools. That does not mean that, does not mean that in that state, Every school and every teacher is able to perform in a manner where all child have all children have recovered their lost learning. That's because you have teacher-wide differences. But if you look at the state overall, because the state has been so clear, absolutely clear, that recover lost learning, that is the priority. It doesn't make sense to start teaching this year's syllabus unless you recover lost learning. That is why you see that difference. So the second state, one minute, second state is somewhere in between, you know, a little bit of mixed messaging that, yeah, yeah, you know, uh, some learning which has uh, been lost has been recovered. So maybe you can start teaching part of the syllabus now, but you must also focus with sort of mixed messages there in the second state. So can I then say two lessons emerge from your anecdotal observations of three states and schools within those three states? First, the lesson that emerges is you need clear direction from the state authorities to teachers and schools that recovery is the priority. You cannot start teaching a new syllabus until the recovery is complete. That is 
critical because that is what made the difference in that school where you went to, where you said there was near complete recovery. The second important lesson that emerges is the quality of the teachers and their dedication and time to ensuring that their pupils, their teach, their children are actually properly taught and handled because you need to be aware of the disadvantage the children have when they've lost two years of teaching. So the second lesson is teachers, the first is state authorities. But there is a third lesson, and you don't write about this in your article, but it emerges from our conversation. It emerges from the fact that there was this teacher who concentrated on class five and said, I won't worry about class four. I've got a year with them later on. That is because there aren't enough teachers. Surely, state authorities should have realized that at this time, we need to increase the teachers in each school. That is another lesson that has to be learned. You need more teachers. Mm. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I yes and no, Karan. And yes and no, because yes, of course, we need more teachers in schools school such as that. There's no question about that. But that's not a short term fix. You know, you can't do this over three months. That's not going to happen. So that point that you're making, what you call the third lesson, what's it, what is it is emphasizing is that in schools, a very large number of schools where you do not have adequate number of teachers, you need to have adequate number of teachers. But you're not going to be able to recruit teachers, deploy them in a short period of time. So it's a lesson for the long term for today, for today. And uh, for today, and I must take your second lesson also, from a second lesson that, that you refer to, which is the teacher quality or teacher commitment, whichever way you look at it, you know, even that is there today. You're not going to change it. The teachers are there. So the question is, given the number of teachers that we have, and given the distribution of their commitment and capacity that teachers have, which you can't change overnight or three months and six months time, it is not going to happen. What is the most important thing? The most important thing, by far the most important thing, is for the state to give clear directions to teachers that prioritize, focus on recovering lost learning. And there are states that have done that marvelously, absolutely clear. And there you can see that they are recovering lost learning much better. And there are states that are either confused or they're declared victories, you know, which is just unwarranted. Let me end this interview by putting this to you. Are state authorities aware of the extent of the problem the children in their states face? Because they may be aware of the problem theoretically, but are they aware of the extent of the problem? And secondly, have they prioritized it sufficiently? Because if there is a difference in the way states are responding clearly, that also suggests that their awareness of the extent of the problem and the priority they're giving it differs state to state. Yeah, I think current. So, I mean, the states that are giving such clear directions, the states that have given such clear direction and they have designed good programs for recovery, clearly they understand the reality. They won't do it otherwise. And, you know, I talk to them all the time and uh, they are very conscious of it and they're totally focused on it and they're deeply committed. In fact, some. some what about those, the other states? The ones that. I'll come to that. I'll, I'll, I'll come to that. What I wanted to point out is that some of these states, I think, are so good or they're acting in such a effective manner that they are already thinking that the situation is such that perhaps we'll have to continue with the recovery program for another six, eight months into the next uh, academic year. So that's that's highly creditable. And of course, on the other end, you have states which seem to have declared victory six months ago, saying all le lost le learning has been recovered. And they seem to be just disconnected. And I'm not very clear whether, you know, whether they don't understand the situation on the ground or whether they see this as some kind of a, a you know a, a dividend that they will get if they declare victory so it's not very clear to me you know it's something so obvious as we are discussing as to why would they behave in that particular manner my last question or maybe two last questions you may not want to answer the first but don't worry can you identify one or two of the states that are doing creditably and deserve praise? Can you also identify one or two of the states that are behaving, and I'm using this word, irresponsibly and are not giving this challenge the priority it deserves? Or would that be awkward for you to do? No, I won't do it, Karan. I won't do it. And because, uh, uh, you know, let's say a couple of the states that are not doing a good job on this particular matter, otherwise they're good states, you know. But they so may be good states, but in this instance, they are extremely bad states. 
So I yeah. think I'm simply saying to you, identify the good ones because they deserve praise. Identify the bad ones because they should be shamed. But if you don't want to, I understand you work with them and you don't want to mm. spoil a relationship that's important. But I thought I would raise that issue and give you the chance or choice to either identify the good ones or the bad ones, but you don't want to. My last question then. Karan, thank you for giving me the choice. No, my last to. question. Is there here a need for the media to constantly highlight the problem? Because other than your articles on the subject, I don't read an awful lot about the challenge of recovering lost learning, nor do I read about the states that are doing it well or the states that are doing it abysmally. So should the media be more focused on this? Absolutely. And I wish, I wish that, you know, some of the larger publications, they sort of ran a meter, you know, a recovery of lost learning meter and which they publish every week or every, every month as to what's going on. Because, you know, this crisis is so, so extraordinary. And, uh, and if we do not do the right thing today, if we do not do the, do the right thing today, you will have a generation of children, a generation of children whose foundations of education will just not be there. Okay. And imagine the effect of this on our country. Absolutely. We will have a generation growing up to become one day rulers of this country who will be effectively uneducated. That, is, can I say one more that thing? is the yeah. crisis we face. Can I say one more thing before we close? And that is when, that is when large parts of the country, many states are demonstrating that it can be done. It can be done. So why a situation where other states are not doing it? So I think the media should focus a lot on it. Let me put this to you. Are the majority of states, the 28 and 7 union territories, are the majority doing well or is the majority doing badly? Or to put it the other way around, is it a minority that have assessed the extent of the problem and responded adequately? And is it a majority that has failed to do so? Give me that answer at least. I don't know, Karan, right now. Maybe I'll know it in three months' time. I haven't. Uh, uh, we haven't yet looked at all the states. So I'll perhaps know in three months' time. So then we cannot say that India as a whole is either responding well to the challenge or the opposite, that India as a whole is not responding adequately. We just don't know what the picture is nationwide. Yeah, I don't think we know that right now. I'm not sure. Dr. Baird, thank you very much for opening our eyes to what is clearly, and I'm using your words, a once-in-a-century crisis. It's a crisis that hasn't got the attention it deserves. It's a crisis for which perhaps many, I won't say the majority, but many states have not woken up adequately. But it is a crisis that will affect our children when they become adults because they will be effectively not well educated. And it will also affect the country because they will be the people who run this country in the future. And that will be a problem for all of us. I thank you for opening our eyes to this once in a century crisis. Thank you, Karan. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on The Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me.